So in the last video on bioenergetic pulsation, I began to show you how our physical bodies, our posture takes on our predominant emotional predisposition. And this is all done through pulsation and the primary pulsation being our breathing. Your body literally is a breathing mechanism. You stop breathing, you die. You're built to breathe. And to the degree that your breathing is affected, the way you breathe, your body is going to take that shape. It's going to take that form, right? Like form equal, equals function. We say that in exercise science and training and this realm of expertise area of knowledge. We talk about how form equals function. The way a thing is formed equals the way it's going to perform. Also, the function of the thing is going to determine its form. So it goes both ways. And you know that because if you just look at a tool, you can say, well, the, the, the shape of that tool, i.e. a hammer, will determine what I'm going to do with it. And this is, what we, this is how we figured out what you know, shape rocks or, or sticks would make a good weapon, right? Well, it looks like it's something that I could beat somebody with, right? So the form will then determine its function. So you know that there's a spectrum there. Form equals function, function, function equals, equals form. And as I said in the previous video on pulsation, we are first and foremost a pulsating organism. The whole world in a way, the whole, all of creation is a pulsating organism, but as a human being, because we're interested in how we can best live our lives, how we can best train so that we can get the results that we want, that we can de develop our bodies and build our bodies in such a way that we get the performance that we want in our sport, but also the way we show up in life and the way our character is expressed through our body. Super important stuff. We're going to dive a little bit into that. We sort of spoke about it before, but for today I'm going to bring it back down to earth a little bit, or maybe for lifters earth, meaning stuff that people who watch this channel or who have been attracted to the things that I talk about on this channel, generally speaking, would really resonate with a bit more than some of the high concepts I began with. And so today, moving from the fact that we're a pulsating organism, the heart pulsates, we spoke about that. The breathing is an important part of our entire physical structure and the way we breathe will determine our, our whole physical pulsation. You know this because your heart rate can be determined by how deep you're breathing or how shallow you're breathing, right? So breathing has a lot to do with it. Breathing has a lot to do with performance. It all sort of blends in and works together. So today I'm going to kind of reintroduce you to a subject, a topic that like a lot of you guys are probably vaguely familiar with, or, or I, how could I say like partially familiar with, you may not know the roots of somatotypes. Somatotypes is the term that we get from Herbert Shelton, William Herbert Shelton, who in the 1940s was an American psychologist. Right. So briefly, just so I can kind of like tie these together and I'm going to tell you a little bit more about the roots of some the somatotypes and Herbert Shelton's theory. But you've heard the term ectomorph, right? A lot of guys, they'll say that, hey, I'm, I'm long, I'm skinny, I'm, I'm, I'm an ectomorph, I'm a hard gainer. A lot of guys will get this term hard gainer uh, as associated with being an ectomorph, right? Skinny dudes. Then you also have the endomorph, right? So these guys have a tendency to put on a little bit more fat, chubby dude, round dudes, right? And that you, uh, once again, we sort of blame, if you will, our somatotype. You could say, hey, I'm, a, I'm an endomorph. What can I do? I'm an endomorph. I look at food and I get fat, right? There's something to that. But just want to point out that that is a type. It's a somatotype. And of course, right in the middle here, we have the mesomorph, right? And so the mesomorph, is the guy that if we, he just looks at weights, he gets built, he gets strong, right? And so we have these three familiar terms. There's a lot of crossover between these terms and the terms that Wilhelm Reich and Alexander Lowen use in explaining bioenergetics, right? Bioenergetic analysis, right? We're not gonna really dive into those too much today. I'll touch them a little bit. But like I said, you know, I wanted to move out of the realm of high concept, psychological, spiritual stuff, right down to like something that is, well, 
somewhat practical, because I'm not going to go into the practicalities uh, like deep today. I'm going to point to what you can generally experience if you are one of these types of people and what you can do in your training to bet, get a better result from your programming. So, I think it's important that we understand who Will, uh, William, William Shelton, Herbert Shelton is. Uh, so I'm gonna read straight from Wikipedia right here. This is gonna be really fascinating because if you've ever used these terms and you use them loosely, you gotta understand where they come from and where there was a split between, hey, we could use this language when it relates to the body, but it goes much deeper into the mind. And that's a big part of what I'm hoping to relay with this series. So, somatotype is a theory proposed by uh, Herbert William Shelton in the 1940s to categorize the human psyche according to the relative contribution of three fundamental elements which he called somatotypes. This is really fascinating. He classified them as ectomorph, mesomorph, and endomorph. He created these terms. You guys may not know this. He borrowed these terms from the three germ layers of embryonic development. Embryonic development means like how a human being, it's in the embryo form, is, is knit together in the womb, is developed in the womb, right? It, you could tell a lot about the human person from its seed, right? Like the coming together of the, of the sperm and the egg, and then it starts to form. So we come out of this uh, embryonic germ, right? And then we grow. It's almost like the seed, like within the seed. Have you ever heard that the oak tree is within the seed? Jesus talks about the mustard seed, right? Like the mustard seed is known for being like just a little, little thing, but inside it is the pattern for everything it can be. And I think even today, you, like there's such a variety of vegetables and plants that come from the mustard seed, meaning the mustard seed is just this tiny little thing, but whoa, it could turn into a million different things, right? So embryonic development's important in this regard. And then there are stages of uh, embryonic development where these three types or, or people that lean towards a predominance of these three stages, types, falls in. Let me get back to reading. So the endoderm, endo inside, is associated with the digestive tract, right? Endomorph comes from the term endoderm, and it has a lot to do with the digestive tract. Not only is the person's digestive tract in this regard evidenced on the outside, we haven't really talked about the inner tube so much yet. Well, you know, we're kind of pointing to it a little bit. But the endomorph is associated with somebody that, generally speaking, has a blockage between the, the, the throat and the anus. And that's why there's a building up here. Psychologically speaking, uh, or the type of trauma they've experienced is usually related to eating and shitting. It's, just, it's the digestive system. And this is according to Reich and Lowen, and you know the term masochist that we're gonna use if we're speaking bioenergetically also comes from Freud. So like, it's kind of weird. There's this sort of blend between what's happening psychologically that affects the body that creates, well, an, a digestive type, an endo, endomorph type. This is the di digestive type. So you then have the mesoderm, the mesoderm, which is a little bit more outside, which is the meso, uh, you would get the mesomorph. And the mesoderm is the muscles, the heart, and the blood vessels. And so with this person, you're talking about the muscles, the heart, and the blood vessels. A lot of the energy moves out to the periphery. We're gonna use these models here in a moment to kind of show you what I'm talking about. A lot, of, a, lot of the, a lot of the energy that this person experiences is held up and out. So the mesomorph. And then you have the ectomorph, and the ectomorph comes from the, uh, the ectoderm. Right? I've written it all here anyway. Ectoderm, which is associated with the nervous system. Right? And so these three somatotypes, right? And, and I'll, I'll hold up my screen real quick here so that you can see how they, they're evidenced in this picture. Right? Look at that. Right? You got the three of them right there. You got the ectomorph, mesomorph, endomorph. Right? He goes on to say... Right? We're not going to get too much into Shelton, but we're going to talk about the physical and then the psychological traits 
according to Sheldon. Um, I spoke briefly about pseudoscience in the last video. I might do a whole video on pseudoscience because this is a sort of soft science, but do not dismiss it by calling it pseudoscience. This is something that is true, but it's not exact, meaning they're patterns. So no one is ever a true ectomorph. It's a pattern, there's tendencies, and there's spectrum, right? So if you, and that's where we get into trouble, and that's where you can call it a pseudoscience if you start to believe this is true, and that you're, and you're faded. You will hear people say, well, I'm just, I'm just a hard gainer. You hear that more in, in our circle than anything. I'm just a hard gainer. I'm an ectomorph. How many times do you find out that that's bullshit? No, you're just not training hard enough. You're not training the right way. Let me put it that way. You're not training the right way for your type. And so you're allowing this, this label to be your destiny. It's the same thing with astrology. Right? And I know I'm kind of going off in left field here right now, but astrology is not true, but it rhymes. These somatotypes are not true, but it rhymes. There's, a, there's patterns that you can't nail down and say it's always the case, but it points to something. So I, I encourage you right now, I did a little bit the other day, and moving forward, I, I might do a whole video about it, do not dismiss these ideas simply, simply as pseudoscience because you're going to miss a lot. It's going to be unfortunate. And that is, you know, to, to dismiss certain ideas because they're not concrete enough for you to say, aha, I've got it, limits science, it limits philosophy, it limits your experience in life. So, little rant over. Now. Let me get into the pseudoscience. <laughs> so there, according to Shelton, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read it off from the book here, but also I wrote it down here. Each one of these have physical traits. And you don't dismiss the physical trait because you can see it. And you don't dismiss the way the person will respond to training because you've seen it also. But because personality, character, Psychology is almost a science of the soul, which in our reductive reasoning, particularly in the West, we've separated anything physical from anything metaphysical. And so it's like, hey, unless I can see it, taste it, touch it, and, and, and count it, measure it, it doesn't even exist, right? And this is why we, you know, atheism, which is a cramp in the brain, it's a, it's a brand new Western thing. No culture, no people. Never have we ever thought that there's no God. Well, you get that when you, when you dial everything into a materialistic reductionist mindset and attitude. That's, 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 a, that's, a, that's a sin. I don't know how else to say it. That's, that's, that causes problems, right? It's, that's, a, that's an error in thinking. That's a pseudo way of thinking. Like there's no truth in that, right? That, that, that there's separation. It's just hard to nail psychology, spirituality, and these soft, that's why I call them soft sciences. You can't call it pseudoscience. That's dismissing it. And even the t definition pseudoscience, you can't use that. I looked up the definition of pseudoscience today, and it means that like it's, a, it's like a malignant assertion that something is true, even though it is, has been proven false or not true. In other words, you can't nail it down. Well, you just can't, you can't throw it out either. Anyway. So with the ectomorph, generally speaking, generally speaking, generally speaking, you're going to get these personality traits. Let's go physical and then psychological. Ectomorph, according to Shelton, characterized as skinny, weak, usually tall with low testosterone levels. Again, generally speaking, there's patterns here. It's not always the case. You can't write this in stone. That's not the intention. Psychological traits, he describes the ectomorph. And the reason why I think this is important, right? I'm doing a lot of backtracking and, and circle talking today because I, I, I want to make sure that nothing gets lost in translation, is that if you understand your body is a function of or an expression of your psychological predisposition through pulsation because of breathing, right? There's a bridge here. 
right? Even that old idea I brought up before about the fact that with materialistic reductionism, we cut body away from soul, but we forget that there's a conduit, that there's a connection. And that connection is pulsation. Pulsation is sort of spiritual and it's very physical. Who knows what's beating the heart, right? And you can say, oh, it's all these, you know, ner neurotransmitters and, and, and synapses and stuff going on. Like, yeah, but yeah, where did that come from? And if you keep going back, ultimately you get to a, a pseudo place. You get to a place where it's like, I don't know. What's making the world pulsate, right? There's a spiritual reality. A lot of quantum physics is pointing to this, um, but then, you know, people say that pseudoscience too. So, ecto, ectomorphs, based on the ectoderm, nervous people, they're very usually very intelligent, right? Not always the case, but this is an archetype. Usually very intelligent, gentle, calm, but self-conscious, very caught up in the head, right? Um, introverted and anxious, right? The, this is the way that Sheldon describes the ectomorph. Later on, I'm going to come full circle. I'm going to talk about the character structures uh, as they're associated with Reich and Lowen. And I talk, I talk about it briefly here, but I wanted to step into Sheldon's work because, hey, we're lifters, right? And so we'll talk about that briefly. So, and, and, and when it comes to Lowen's work, Reich's work, although this is described very similarly, they're coming from more of a psychopathology place, which I think is helpful because, well, we all have some sort of psychopathology or predisposition that kind of holds us back in life. We know we could be better than we are, but I have this tendency to escape into my mind and, and, and live, the war, live life intelligently, but not embodied, right? I'm usually very introverted, right? They live in, it. usually these people are very creative, very intelligent, introverted, because a lot of times they're living in a, in a, in a world of their own. A lot of these guys are scientists and artists, like, you know, they're bringing forth like amazing, imaginative, we talked about the imagination the other day, imaginative powers because their, 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 their power is on the inside. And we'll talk about this briefly, this, this map here that I'm showing. Their power is on the inside. Remember fear, they're fear types. Fear makes you do what? <gasps> makes you freeze. It makes you take a short breath in <gasps> and then hold. So all the power builds up on the inside at the core, right? All the energy, all the, all the, all the all well, the pulsation is at the core. So these people aren't very embodied often, but they're but they're, the energy has to go somewhere. Energy doesn't is never destroyed, right? That's that's physics, right? It's transmutated. It goes somewhere else. It's tr it's transferred, transmutated, uh, turned into something else. And so what happens with this person is because of the fear, they withdraw from the body, and all the energy goes bang up into the head. I should have made the head bigger, right? Bigger, so these are these are heady people, intelligent people, gentle and calm. Not meaning that that they're they're you know lovely people, although they are. All, everybody here is lovely in their own way, but because their bodies are weak, so they ought to be gentle. They have to be gentle and calm, right? Like I'm I'm a lot of this over here and, and into this, right? I, there's a spectrum, and we'll talk about spectrums in another video. Um, I, but I know I'm not very gentle. Even the way I talk, I'm very charismatic. I'm talking with my whole body and I'm, the energy's coming out at you in the screen, right? A lot of people will come to me, a lot of like my students will come to me or people will hire me and they're this. And they're like, Elliot, how can you teach me to be more like that? And I'm like, well, you can, which happens a lot of times, you could reverse engineer your behavior to, to pretend to be a little bit more like these. You see a lot of that in the pickup community. These guys, because they're so clever, they reverse engineer being more like one of these, <laughs> right? And so they like watch and they study and it's like, oh, that's how the alpha does it. Hmm. And then they create a system, because they're so intelligent, to play alpha. Boom, they, you know, they know what to say, how to do it. These are magician types also. If we're gonna talk about archetypes or the four quadrants of the psyche, boy, there's so much we could talk about. I'm going there. But that this type, uh, will often be a magician. They can, t they can, they can make themselves, they're, they're more likely to 
play, make believe themselves into another type. Right? This per this one's stuck. He is who he is, and this is the hardest to change. They're just they're just stuck. This person's very light, very light footed. They can, they, unless you work at the care, at the body level, the body you can really ch do great change at the body level. But most people don't know that unless you're a bodybuilder, which is pretty cool. Right? That's why I'm attracted to the, all this is one thing for me. You're a bodybuilder. You can, do, you can do some damage in a good way, you know, changing yourself from an ectomorph, calling yourself a, you know, a, a hard gainer. If you, if you don't just accept that as your fate, you could do some real, you could do some real damage good, in a good way. <laughs> so that's, that, I will stick right here for a moment. And so that's Shelton's example of the ectomorph, right? Let's go over to this end of the spectrum also too, because it's sort of, it's broad. And the mesomorph is somewhere sort of, sort of in the middle. It's all very fuzzy, like I said, pseudo. But it rhymes, it points to something, it's pattern oriented. And so you don't, I don't need to prove anything for you to know this is true. You know how you know a lot of what I'm saying is true? Just look at Hollywood. Think about the nerd. He's usually skinny. He's usually got glasses way up in his head, sitting at the computer, disembodied, right? Think about the fat, funny guy, right? He's very friendly. He's, all, he's very funny. He's fat, right? Why would Hollywood cast type these people? Because there's something to it, right? And then the, the mesomorph. Now, I'm leaving out some types, and of course, there are blended types and stuff like that. The mesomorph is like the angry guy. Like the, A lot of times, he's a bad guy. Right? In fact, Herbert Shelton, a lot of his work started being used in a very pseudoscientific way. Like it gets deep with something called criminology, where they were trying to determine which type is more likely to be a criminal, right? And you see that a lot now today with these um, social, social credit scores. This is dangerous. This is where you start getting into like eugenics and stuff. So this is, it can, it can get dangerous as a pseudoscience, like eugenics, right? And, um, and of course, you know, criminology, it's like, what? So you just, so he decided, he determined that these are the types that are typically going to be uh, criminals and, and, and there's something to it, right? Once again, it rhymes, right? In astrology, like I'm an Aries. I take on all the characteristics in Aries, but I'm not an Aries. I can't say that that's me and whatever's happening in this in the stars is exactly what's gonna to happen to me. That doesn't make any sense. That's when it becomes an idol and that's when it becomes sinful and that's when it's like, okay, you don't look at it, right? Don't look at it if you're so stupid to believe it. But look at it because it's like, hey, there's something interesting there, right? But, you know, that's neither here nor there, right? So, uh, the endomorph type, digestive system, uh, endoderm, friendly, happy, Laid back, lazy, right? Think about Hollywood. Fat, laid back, funny, lazy, right? And then you can get into stereotypes where you say like, oh, just because they're fat, they're lazy. But I know a lot of, I know, know a lot of endomorphs that are not lazy. I mean, they're working and they still can't change themselves because it's psychosomatic. If you really want to change yourself, you got to work, work from both ends of the spectrum. This is what we're getting at. That's where we're going. So that's the you know masochist type. We'll talk about the energy dynamics in a moment, uh, and then bring full circle to pulsation or go back to pulsation. And you got the meso, you got the mesomorph. This is the person who's associated with the mesoderm, uh, big heart. So you know a lot, very passionate, right? Um, these people not only commit the most crimes, <laughs> but they're also the best leaders. They're charismatic and given a, a, a helpful predisposition, a charitable predisposition. They want to fight for the small guy. They want to help out and they want to do the right thing for people. You know what I'm saying? They're usually, these, these two are usually like, they go hand in hand because this type doesn't know how to stand up for themselves, but they're really friendly and gentle and they, they sort of mirror each other or have each other's shadow. And so a lot of ectomorphs and mesomorphs like, he loves his energy and he loves, he loves his friendship, right? 
this person's gentleness, right? You get a couple of mesomorphs together and we're like, you know, one-upping each other, especially if you're unevolved, you know what I'm saying? You, none of this is fate, right? But there are tendencies. So competitive, extroverted, tough. That's how Shelton describes the mesomorph. Which one do you lean towards, right? Can you say that this is untrue whatsoever? Now, one of the things that Shelton asserted is that, of course, once again, if he, and he's a real scientist, he was a real doctor, his work wasn't totally refuted, and he understood there has to be some play here. He would give a score based on three, three numbers, each uh, could go up to a seven. So you could be, you know, a blend of this. You could be like, say, you're like a six here, a, 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 a two here, and a four here, right? You know what I'm saying? And so you'd be like six, two, four. This is characterology. When you get into characterology, it gets real fuzzy. That's why even like the, um, you know, ENFP, you know, uh, what do they call Carl Jung, you know, Briggs Myers, like these things, they're not true, but people love them because it tells you a little bit about yourself. There's, it's, it's fascinating, it's interesting, but you can't say, oh, I'm a INTJ and like, that's it, I'm an INTJ. No, wait a second, hold on. You can change. In fact, throughout life, you might experience change whether you're aware of it or not. Characterology, character types, any of these things, we have a tendency towards, but it doesn't lock our fate. And I think that's important. It has to be refer reiterated over and over again. A lot of people will nod their head and say, oh yeah, 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 I get it, I get it, I get it. But do you? The minute you start making excuses for any of this is the minute you start believing that it's actually you, right? And that comes with any character typing. So, I mean, I think when it comes to the high concept, psychology, spirit, uh, I think the best way, now I'm not talking physically, right? But the physical will manifest itself or the, the mental will manifest itself physically. But I think the, the, the best character, under, trying to understand character from a psychological, spiritual, psychological standpoint is the work of Robert Moore, King, Warrior, Magician, Lover, right? And it's because he believes that we have not a type, but what he calls a system self. I'm going off in left field right now. But a system self is, in other words, an ego that knows that it can be broken and reformed at any time. The minute you begin to notice how you behave in these four quadrants, you can say, oh man, well, my, my magician's in the shadow. And my, and my warrior is very predominant, right? That, that, that happens to me, right? My magician has been in the shadow because I was told when I was a kid that I have ADHD and that I'm never, I never did get in good in school. And was always like, hey, you're not really smart. And so I, like, I, I cast that off, that intelligence to other people. I was like, oh, well then, I had a friend named Michael. He was my intelligent friend. Well, he's smart. He was gifted. There's my intelligent friend. I mean, I'm not like him, so he gets to carry that for me. And, well, I'm the warrior type, right? And I'm big, strong, and whatever. So I got into fights. And I would stand up for my weaker little friends. You see what I'm saying? But that happens because of tendency and then environment. Remember I said the other day, that energy will create the body and then the body will reinforce the energy. The mind will create the body and then the body will reinforce the mind. You begin to experience yourself. So anyway, the point is that my, if we're talking about me here for a moment, my magician doesn't need to stay in the shadow. If I decide, hey, you know what? I'm actually kind of bright. I can be smart. If I study and I, and I want to make something happen in a particular way from a spiritual, psychological pre point, I can do it. I absolutely can do it. In fact, the magician has a lot to do with transmutation. Tons to do with transmutation. My whole life is a transmutation. Right? You're watching, you just, if you've been watching me since 2007, you've watched me like shapeshift, right? That's magician stuff, right? And I'm, because I'm conscious of it. Anyway, not talking about me. So where do you lean? What do you resonate with most, right? What do you think? Who are you? Where are you? Because they will 
being able to understand this will give you an opportunity to work with it. Okay? And, and if nothing else, it's fascinating so that you're aware. Now, so that's Shelton's character types or somatotypes. Now, going back to pulsation, meaning, well, how are these, for, these types formed? Well, once again, it's fuzzy. It could be your genetics, but genetics is a fuzzy thing because there is a science of epigenetics. So is it genetics or is it also environment, right? Like you, you can, okay, you could say, oh, well, my mom was an ectomorph, my granddad was an ectomorph, and so on and so forth. It's like, yeah, but are they passing on their behavioral and thinking qualities? Like it's literally being passed on to you through mirror neurons. You know, if you study like the work of Daniel Siegel and he talks about interneural biology, is it because your mom is imprinting you your mind through the mirror neurons in the prefrontal cortex, through the vagus nerve into your heart, which of course is the major pump, which your body will then take the form of that pump. It gets crazy. <laughs> but the whole point is, you're doing it and it's doing you. If you're aware, then you got some power. So what happens energetically? What happens to the pulsation? We spoke briefly or, or quite a bit about in the previous video, the fear type. Now, according to Reich and Jung, they call this the schizoid. Schizoid, I'm saying slash oral, because once again, there's a spectrum and oral is one of the five types of Wilhelm Reich, and we're only talking about three, right? There, there are two others that are not present here. I may do a video, I probably will, that goes into his character types, but this is, I thought this was simple and, and super cool, so we're gonna stick with it. So what, is, what, what happens with the fear type? Well, it's determined on what you do, what happens to your body, you know this is true, when you are afraid. If somebody jumps out from behind a bush, what do you do, <gasps> right? You instantly retreat in. You suck whatever you can get, boom, and then hold it on the inside. Well, that's what this is. What you're seeing here is the energy being sucked in and stuck at the core. When the energy is sucked in, what, what do you think it draws away from? Well, it draws away from the mesoderm. It goes into the nervous system, right? For this type, it draws deep into the nervous system, which is the deepest part of our, of our body in a way, meaning, yeah, yeah, it's like our root system. If you look at like the peripheral nervous system, right, and the brain, like the central and the peripheral nervous system, if you, I had a picture once where you like, you pull it out and you know, you just look in, a, look in any anatomy book. It literally looks like a flower, like a bud, right? A bulbous, a stem, and nerves. So this person, it just draws, draws right in, right in. And so in, um, in like trauma therapy and you know a lot of the work of Robert Scare he talks about how the energy draws in when when an animal is being attacked or a person is being attacked it draws in but it doesn't go away if and what that is is a person goes into a freeze this person is in a lot of ways frozen even their movement patterns are a little frozen a little uh, disjointed their joints According to Lowen, he would say their joints are frozen. They're kind, you might even notice like they're kind of like robotic sometimes, not all. A lot of them are kind of robotic in their movement, right? And that's because the, the, the energy draws in, boom, gets trapped in the nervous system. What in a lot of forms of trauma therapy, bioenergetics, but I'm thinking about the work of David Balducci in particular, trauma release therapy, um, they refer to, Peter Levine talks about this as well, you know, with the lion, but when the trauma experience has passed, naturally speaking, in nature, and it's, it's for humans too, only that we have, you know, we, we repress this, there becomes a shaking. In fact, like if you ever get, you see somebody really scared, they're shaking, shaking. That's, that's the pulsation just unable to hold itself at the core and it's sort of like trying to fight to get out, right? When we, when we do some bioenergetic exercises, we produce a, a vibration, a shaking, right? That's sort of like, that's sort of like the, 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 the tense energy on the inside wanting to work its way out softly. See what I'm saying? Anyway, fear <gasps> causes you to draw in and freeze. 
the mesomorph anger. Anger. Wilhelm Reich and Lowen refer to this as the psychopath. This person is referred to as a psychopath. The psychopath, well, I'll get to these in a moment. The psychopath, it's anger. And so what happens when you're angry, right? When you're angry, there's this tendency to rise up and then hold it, right? Because, I mean, it could rise up and bang, you just knock somebody, right? You could do that. You could do that. We also have an, a superego, right? Freud would call it superego, which, which is uh, controlled by the muscular system. The muscular system, is, and of course, this is fuzzy too. Ego, superego is controls the conscious mind and that what do we, I'm consciously moving my arms, but I'm unconsciously beating my heart, right? So the more of the muscle, muscular system, uh, these people are a bit more coordinated, but like the, the, the energy is on the outside, it's on the periphery. So if you notice, it's pushing to the muscles. That's why the muscles get so bulky and big, right? Her, tense, holding it, right? So, and you know this is true because what happens when you get, when you're, when you're angry, there's a big breath in, no breath out, right? So a big breath in, most of our problems is, at least for these two types, no breath out, all of them, there's no breath out. <laughs> Waiting to exhale, there's a movie called Waiting to Exhale when I was a kid, it was a bunch of black girls who couldn't find women or couldn't find a husband. And then like when they finally find a man, oh, they breathe, all right? I don't know, we'll get into that another day. So, but the whole idea is like, my stress is over. I can let down, I can breathe out. All of these are trapped, these are all breathing trap, deep or at the surface. Goes in, gets trapped. It goes in, right? But it, it gets trapped at the muscular system, not at the core. Trapped at the muscular system. Anger, psychopath, uh, holds up. So I'll, I'll talk about this briefly. This person holds up. So a lot of the energy, because anger is, is extroverted, it goes this way. Anger comes, across, comes this way. And you know this, because it's just like an animal. If you're going to attack somebody, right? Talking about black girls. You ever see a bunch of black girls fight? Right? Comes this way. That's anger. So it holds up, right? So if you get angry, you know, like, the schizoid, the fear type holds together. Just hold it together. I don't want to fall apart. And all the energy on the inside feels like an existential crisis. Like, I'm going to fall apart. I'm going to fall apart. That's why there's a lot of anxiety. Endomorph. So, the energy dynamics of the endomorph is stuck. We talked about that before. Pain. Right? Pain. And, and I used the term cringe the other day. And cringing is basically a holding in. So, we talk about holding in. But... Reich and Freud call this the masochist. And it's because like you're beating yourself up on the inside because the masochist takes in the energy, right? Like anybody else, like because there's an in-breath, but it, it, it's like stuck. It's like, I don't know what to do right now. You know when you cringe? That's why the perfect way to describe this person is a cringe. <laughs> when you cringe, it's because like you're like, what's the word, ambivalent? Like, I don't... I don't know what to do. Like, I want to reach out. I want to say something, but I, I'm confused. And so there's this, there's just this stuckness. So there's a moving out, but then a, a concomitant shutting down. The energy dynamics, I mean, this is just one example of the energy dynamic, but the energy dynamic and the emotion that's associated, which is a conceptual emotion associated with the endomorph is guilt. Because they want to move out and express themselves but they stop themselves from doing so. So they, 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 they hold in, right? Holds in. You see that? So, and pain is associated with, well, just think about it. Like when you cringe, you make like a painful face. Think about when you're in pain, what do you do? Ow! Ah! I did that in the other video, so you guys get this, right? These videos all build on top of each other. So if you're enjoying this one, go back and watch the previous one and the previous one and, hey, you know, watch my videos and share them. So, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of wrap up with this because I'm going high concept. And then, look, I might do a whole video chapter in, these, you know, in this series on practicalities. 
But I just have to show you, and you know, when I say practicalities, I mean like all this is practical if you know how to use it, if, you, if, you know, if this makes sense to you and you're like, oh, and how to use it. But I'll get into specific exercises and all kinds of stuff. I'm just gonna give it all to you guys right here. Anatoly Bondarchuk was an Olympic thrower. I think he was a, I think he was a shot put or a discus thrower, or maybe a jazz, he's a thrower anyway. Powerful athlete, became a coach. He started to understand that his students, his athletes, they were different types, right? And by the way, I got this from Charles Poliquin. Charles Poliquin talked about these types in a, in a powerful, a great article that he did on T Nation many years ago. And he blew it out. He blew these three types out into five types. Just think about how interesting that is. Three types, and these aren't the three types. I'm going to talk to you about the three types in a moment because they relate to your training. Three types, and then Paul Quinn went back and blew it out to five types based on Eric Braverman's work of neurotransmitter. So this goes deep, fellas. It depends on how, how, how far you want to go, but each one of these have a neurotransmitter type. I'm going to dive into that maybe another time. You know, maybe I'll come full circle, kind of layering these, these lessons, trying to move through these lessons, but also I'll come back and I'll layer but very interesting, look into uh, Eric Braverman, Charles Paul Quinn, neurotransmitter types. I think Braverman used Chinese elements and then Paul Quinn noticed that each one of the Chinese elements associated with certain neurotransmitters. And they, they in a way, they relate to these character types. And, if you, and listen, if you, you know neurotransmitters, they determine your mind and your body. Neur neurotransmitters are like the little chemicals that are synapsing all throughout your nervous system. They're going to determine a whole lot, like how you behave and how you train, how you act, how you perform, how you use your body. Fascinating stuff, right? Fascinating stuff. Pseudo fascinating stuff. Don't throw it away. Anatoly Bondarchuk, he recognized that there were three types that, that when he was designing training programs, he recognized that some athletes could train with a lot of volume and they'd be just fine and others you give them too much volume and like the next day they couldn't train so how is it that you give everybody the same workout right if you're working with a team you give everybody the same workout but it's like half the guys it's like they didn't do anything the day before or a third of the guys it's like they did nothing another third of the guys they're fried they're burnt out and another third of the guys they they're bored you see what i'm saying so it's like you can't give the same training program to every single person across these somatotypes or these, what he called um, training types, right? Or responders, he called them responders. So briefly, I'm not gonna go too much into this because like, you know, a lot of you guys are already into, you know about training, right? That's why I'm not making videos about training. Go watch, there's a lot of really good channels out there that talk more grounded training stuff, right? I like training, I love training, but. I, I go deep, right? I go deep. So, and it's just me. If you like what I'm talking about, then let's roll. You got volume types. Volume types. Just think about what it is. These people are pulled, are drawn in. Ectomorphs are drawn in. Their energy is drawn in. So in order for them to really get some benefit from their training, they got to do a lot of stuff. Like, yo, I need, I just got to keep stimulating, keep stimulating, keep stimulating. These, according to, well, I'm linking these up together. I don't know if Anatoly Bondarchuk knew anything about endomorphs or somatotypes. And I'm pretty sure he didn't know anything about character structures. But he recognized that there was a volume type. In fact, let me see if I have it here. There were some examples in Paul Quinn's article about, yeah, the three types of athletes. And he gave, he gave examples of each. You know, so according to Bondarchuk's theory, the volume type will be like a Arnold Schwarzenegger. Arnold Schwarzenegger is a volume type. Think about Arnold, tall. You ever see pictures of Arnold when he was a, like a kid, like young Arnold, 16 years old? He's not a mesomorph, and he's definitely not an ecto, uh, ectomorph, uh, um, endomorph. He's, never, he's not short and thick and, and round like a, um, like a Lee Priest, right? You guys know who Lee Priest is? You ever see Lee Priest when he used to bulk? He was like a little white bowling ball, like a, like a cue ball. Right? I kind of, like, I like that. Like, I, I, I lean towards that. Lee Priest, I thought, was so cool. Because he's like a little 
round dude. When I played football, I was like a little bowling ball, right? Because I lean this way more than I do this way. Arnold, tall and lanky, really tall. Now, like I said before, he never said he was a hard gator because he trained. If you read Arnold Schwarzenegger's Encyclopedia of Bodybuilding, the volume in that shit is crazy. Do you see the high volume that Arnold does? Volume type, tall, right? Definitely an intelligent guy, right? More, I would say, probably schizoid oral. Definitely oral. Definitely oral, compensated oral. We'll get into that another time. But definitely an oral. Just think about like how he, he was a movie star. Oral types are usually very friendly. They're very artistic. A lot of women. Orals are very, you know, much like lovers, lover boys. Um, maybe schizoid. I know he was from Eastern Europe. Probably during, he grew up probably in a very difficult time. A lot of split splits happen when you come from parents that have like poverty or like war, right? So, you know, that would make sense that he's this type. Then you have um, intensity responders, right? Intensity responders are people who respond like to very heavy weight and explosive stuff, right? But they'll burn out real quick. This guy will never be as explosive as this guy, right? And you just think about the, what, what the, what the um, endomorph does, he holds in. So if you give an endomorph an opportunity to, bah, to explode, that, that energy's there. And I tend to think that these uh, courses of spectrum, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of mesomorph or psychopath in the masochist if, if he starts to express himself. That's why I know I'm kind of like this. I'm definitely an endomorph. I'm definitely a, a masochist because I have a lot of energy that I hold in. And if I'm feeling guilty or if I'm feeling shame, Right? I just, I won't even express myself. That's why, like, I, for 10 years, I've been doing this. Right? Like, making videos, not making videos. Making videos, not making videos. Right? Am I going to express myself? Am I going to express my truth? Or am I going to hold back because of what people will say? Right? I, that's me. But when I start expressing myself, I'm a psychopath. Bang! Right? So, anyway, this intensity responder, power lifters. Think about power lifters. Not all of them, especially these days, you know, they're getting much leaner because we're realizing that we don't have to be fat. But I remember in the early days of like learning about like Louis Simmons and West Side Barbell and Elite FTS, like these guys were all fat and happy. Like, they, well, fat and angry, but fat and it, like happy being fat. It was just like, hey, let's just eat, right? Let's just eat a bunch of food and get real fucking explosive. This is what an endomorph will do. They very rarely will they decide to make a change and become a bodybuilder, although some of them do, and get lean. They'll generally, you know, lean towards their strengths. It's like, hey, I'm a, and plus they're digestive types. Just think about that. Endo means endoderm, right? So a lot of the energy is held within the, the digestive system, up at the throat and down at the, the inner tube, really. And so, like, you'll get, like, these guys will have, like, like a high-pitched voice. Whenever I have my high-pitched voice, I'm being... More of an endomorph, right? And you know, they respond to powerlifting, fat powerlifters. Anyway, so you get it. Mesomorph, what do you think? Variety, variety. These are, so you get more like a Louis Simmons over here, you get like an Arnold over here, and you get like, according to, uh, Paul Quinn, he said like a Frank Zane, but like these guys are, are form, they like are natural born bodybuilders, right? They're built in a certain way that just allows the muscle, like the, the it just comes right out to the muscle. Like they got all they got to do is just a little bit of work and they can blend it like Frank Zane blended. Frank Zane would, depending on the season, I, I bought a couple books from Frank Zane because I thought he was, an, he had an amazing body, always stayed lean, um, but he was smart, right? He, you know, he, he. He did the right thing. He went through seasons where he would lift real heavy, like sets of five, and then he would progressively change it. And he just his body just took on, his muscle system would just take on whatever it is that he's doing. My body will do the same thing, right? I lean, I'm, I'm kind of in this, this area right here. So meso, meso, uh, mesomorph, they, when it says variety responder, meaning they can respond to high volume, I think some of the best my body has ever looked 
was when I started doing 100 rep sets. I have, video, I have pictures that I often use. And, and back on my channel, I guess I would say like 2018, I was doing some, you can go back, maybe, uh, I'm not gonna link any videos. I just don't have time to do that. But you go back and you look, it was doing some like 100 rep, just look up Elliot 100 rep. I was doing some 100 rep workouts. <laughs> Man, my body, I, cause I never did it before. And it added variety, my body was just responding. It was looking great. I should go do that again. But at the same time, I'm also a high intensity guy. Like I want to lift the 300 pound stone. You see what I'm saying? <laughs> I want to flip a tire, right? That's more fun to me. But I sure as hell respond to a variety of types of training. That's why you never want to take advice from this guy. <laughs> Don't take training. Then I started doing Mike Menser stuff. So I was doing high volume, I had a great looking body. Then I did Mike Menser stuff and I had a great looking body. Don't listen to us. <laughs> Don't listen to mesomorphs because whatever we do is going to fucking work. And if you're an ectomorph and you're like thinking, oh, wow, you know, look at Elliot's body. He's doing high, Mike Mentor high intensity training. It might not work the same way for you. Right? I have no problem telling you, hey, this is the best way. And if you notice, listen to me long enough, you'll hear me say, I'll contradict myself. But it's not because I'm trying to lie to you. It's because when I'm being unconscious, I gotta realize, oh shit, not everybody has my genetics, right? And, and, and most mesomorphs, if you listen to them and try to follow all their advice, unless they're scientific, meaning they're objective, right? And there are a lot of guys that are like that. They're objective. They're just like, hey, look, I'm just giving you the science. I'm just showing you the results. And when I say objective, meaning even science can be very subjective. Don't be fooled. When somebody says science, a lot of times it's scientism. Meaning, like, it's political. They're using it to, to make a point. Most science in today is political science. It's all like, yo, I'm, we're, we're just using science to prove what we want to prove, right? That's why most science today, in a lot of ways, is pseudoscience, right? Look up the definition of pseudoscience on Wikipedia, and you'll be like, are you sure? Because there's a lot of things that's very political in there. It's like, wait a second. Just because just Wikipedia says that that's pseudoscience doesn't mean that it's pseudoscience. Right? It all depends on who the establishment is, right? We all call this science, right? Think about 2020, what happened during 2020, right? All the science. Now, we're not so sure. Follow the science. Remember all the people following science? They're killing over and dying right now. <laughs> Follow the science, right? So science, I'm not knocking science, but science can be used as a, in a pseudo, pseudo, pseudo way. All of it, right? So, but there are, you know, anyway, the point is that if, if, if you're gonna listen to somebody and they're giving you like cross-referenced articles or scientific studies that, that look at all the different angles, hey, take that guy's advice. You know, but if you're just, listen, you're just gonna take somebody's advice because of the way they look and what they say to do, well, you had better be the same kind of type as them. Otherwise, you're gonna lose it. So that's it, that's all, I hope you enjoyed this. Ectomorph, mesomorph, endomorph, we gave an overview on what a somatotype is and we brought it right down to what you need to do based on Bonder Chuck's training suggestions. Hope that helps, done.